the uh, main uh, thing that about parallelogram law last time. So, let us recall. If you have a nonlinear space, then there exists an inner product on x such that it induces this norm that is norm x is equal to square root of x comma x if and only if the norm satisfies the parallelogram law. And if it does in this case, the inner product has to be defined as one x y equal to one fourth norm x plus y squared minus norm x minus y squared if the field is real and 2 x y equal to 1 fourth norm x plus y squared plus minus norm x minus y squared plus i times norm x plus i y squared minus norm x minus i y squared. So, this is the fundamental identity, uh, the second one is called the polarization identity. Okay. So, now we know which uh, under what conditions a norm is really going to give a geometry okay, or the inner product. So, we already seen, seen that among L p n and L p only p equal to 2 norm gives rise to an inner product, inner product as above. Okay. That satisfies the, that is the only case where the parallelogram law is satisfied and therefore, the inner product can be defined and that comes out of that norm comes out of an inner product. Uh, okay, uh, probably how many of you attended the measure theory course by Professor Atraya? 1, 2, 3. I okay, will try uh, uh, you do not need the measure theory, but I mean uh, you need but I will do it in an intuitive way. I will give you an example uh, which uh, we will use again and again. I mean as a as a sort of uh, capturing Hilbert spaces. Okay. Uh, so, one example let us take some set omega. any non empty set of course. Okay. Now, I am going to consider the sigma algebra of all subsets of omega. In other words, I am going to consider all subsets of omega. So, forget about the terminology sigma algebra. So, P omega denotes the set of all subsets of omega, the power set, the set of all subsets of omega. It is like the events, if you are familiar with probability theory, omega is the sample space and I am going to consider every subset as an event, okay. but then I am not going to assign probability measure, but I am going to assign a different measure. I am going to assign a measure which is not going to be a probability measure. Now, what I am going to uh, look at is like ebb if you take this rectangle as a whole it has an area 
right? We can say the length into breadth. But if you take individual points, they have no area. Okay. So the points do not seem to have a mass, but together they seem to produce a mass. They have an area. So that is a sort of tricky situation so you get into measure theory. But now what we will do is we will avoid such tricky situation. We will say every point has a mass, every point has a unit mass. Okay. So what does that mean? The, the measure if for any set A that is any subset of omega, anything that belongs to P omega we define the measure of A or the mass of A well there are so many uh, points in each fellow as one mass so add them all. Okay? So actually therefore it is going to be equal to the number of points in A because each point has 1 kg mass. Okay? So therefore it is the number of points which will be infinity if A is an infinite set and the number of points in A if A is a finite set. So, we will let us put it this way the number of points in A if A is finite. So, that simply means it is cardinality of A and the is plus infinity if A is an infinite set. So, only finite sets have finite mass, infinite sets have infinite mass. Assume there are infinite number of fellows in this world, everybody has 1 rupee in his pocket. So, the if you take a collection of fellows, then the number of rupees they have is its measure. If it is infinite, it is infinite, if finite, it is the number of persons there, each fellow is going to contribute 1 rupee. This is called a counting measure, okay, this is what is called the counting measure. We can show that uh, it satisfies all the axioms of a measure and uh, the only thing is unlike the uh, real line uh, where infinite sets can have finite Lebesgue measure, right? uh, an infinite set has finite area. Okay. So, that sort of tricky situations can happen and another thing in the real situation is you can write it as the union of a finite num uh, union of a finite measured sets. The whole real line can be written as the union of a finite number of uh, a, in a countable number of finite measured sets. So it is such things are called sigma finite measures. Okay, sigma is always countable union, countable union of finite measured sets. But that you cannot do here. The moment you put more than finite number of sets, it is going to be finite number of elements, it is going to be infinite measure. So, it cannot uh, it cannot be uh, made as the union of a finite number of uh, countable union of finite num finite measure sets. Okay, forget about all that. So, this is called the counting measure. Now, just like you can do integration with the Lebesgue measure you can also do integration with respect to this measure. You have done integration with respect to measure, right? Lebesgue measure. How does one do? I have completely digressed now, suddenly this is my problem. Okay. Anyway, it does not matter. How does one do integration with respect to a general measure or at least with respect to the Lebesgue measure? You are familiar with that? How many of you are familiar with integration? With to the general Lebesgue measure, one, not many. Okay, so let's forget about functional analysis for a while. Let me just give you a small uh, intuitive uh, look into peep into this. Okay, okay, forget about measure and all. Uh, uh, what was integration? What does integration really mean to you physically? I mean, let us start with. In an intuitive manner, we have some curve and we would like to find the area below the curve. So, let us start with that. Okay. 
So let us draw a, see, a cheat, we cheat by drawing a convenient picture. Okay. So let us say I have a function from A to B, I draw the graph of that function, this is f of t f of x, so that is the x axis. So I have this function from A to x, I see I have cheated by putting the whole curve above the x axis, what if it is below the x, let us first take the case where everything is positive, positive area. Okay. So now I want to find this area. This is what I want to find and that is what would be denoted the integral over the interval a b of f of x t x right. Now what Riemann did, Riemann and his predecessors and up till leg, uh, Lebeg, what people did was the following. Well, we do, well, let us do what Archimedes did, he, we did not progress much beyond Archimedes. Archimedes found the area of curved with curved boundaries by means of what he called as, you know what he called? He called it the method of exhaustion. By the time you do it, you get exhausted, some, some sort of thing. No, you start get exhausting by pieces. What did he do? He approximated all of them with rectilinear boundaries and once you have rectilinear boundaries, we know how to calculate the area because the moment you have a picture which is a polygon, we can always divide a polygon into triangles and we can calculate the area of each triangle and I know how to calculate the area of a triangle. How do I calculate the area of a triangle? If I have a triangle, I draw, I divide it into two right angle triangles. So I can calculate the area, but how do I calculate the area of a right angle triangle? It is half of a rectangle and how do I calculate the area of a rectangle? Make them into smaller squares. So basically therefore, it only that is why it is called square inch. The area we write it as square centimeters, square inch that means there are so many squares that can be eventually be fitted with one inch as their site. That is why the it, uh, unit called square inch, so many squares with the inch site is measured or so many squares with centimeter size is measured. So basically therefore, if you know square, you know rectangle, if you know rectangle, you know right angle triangle, if you know right angle triangle, you know all triangles, if you know all triangles, you know all polygons, then therefore live with polygons. Okay. So what, what did Riemann do? What Riemann did was, first of all, he divided this interval into number of equal pieces okay. and then he erected all these ordinates okay. He erected all these ordinates and then said I will calculate the area of each one of this. So let me uh, call a typical sub interval as i k, okay, sub k equal to 1 to n, there are so many sub intervals. So then what I do is, I calculate the area of this, he said I do not know what the area is because there is a curved thing here. Well what I will do is, I will overestimate and I will do an underestimation. So what he did was, he replaced the value of the function by the highest value in that interval okay, and then put that rectangle. So this rectangle becomes an overestimate of the area that he was trying to calculate. So let us say the maximum of f of x, that is all assumed now therefore we must assume they exist, the bounded function. Okay. The max that is why Riemann could integrate, integrate only bounded functions maximum of f x in the interval i k, let us call it as capital M k. So, this 
So, that height is m k, this height is this height is m k. Okay. Then he calculated this area, that area is the length of this interval times the height. So, the area of the a k let me call as the kth region as a k. So, the area a k is the length of the interval i k into m k, right? That is the uh, that is the this interval, this one. Then he added all of them. Right, and that was the overestimation of the integral. Certainly, an overestimation of the integral, because at every place, I, in every part, I added an extra piece. So, therefore, that is certainly what I have got is more than what was required. Then, what he did was, well, I will also calculate. Instead of the maximum, I will take the minimum. So, let me call the minimum of f x, x belong to i k to be equal to little m k. So, then I will calculate the uh, summation a k l i k uh, m k l i k is the summation a k s. And that is an o that is an underestimate. Right? So he got now something I he says somewhere it should be here. Okay. Then what? So I have an overestimate, I have an underestimate. Well, I would ask the overestimating fellows, give me the best overestimate. What does that mean? Try to do as little extra as possible. That means, among all the overestimate, take the smallest one that is the infimum. So, what Riemann did was you calculate the infimum for all partitions. That is, this division can be done in many ways. You do it all possible ways, for each one you do an overestimation and you get the minimum. So, that is the best overestimate you can get and similarly he said you do the best underestimate. What does that mean? It should be the supremum over all partitions. That is the largest underestimate possible. The largest underestimate and the smallest overestimate. If you are lucky they must collapse and give you the value. So, this he called as the uh, upper integral, this is called as the lower integral and if the upper is equal to lower, he called it the function to be integrable and the common value is the integral. Simple common sense, absolutely uh, no. Uh, so, you first define overestimates, take the best overestimate, call it upper integral define underestimates and take the best underestimate call it the uh, lower integral and if integral lower equal to integral upper we say Riemann said f is Riemann integrable. And the common value is the integral. is integral f dx a to b. That was what Riemann was. Okay. Now, what Lebesgue did was little different from this, but required a lot of work. What Lebesgue did was intuitively, okay, we will put the, the he said, think of these as currency notes standing up, okay, they are all been piled, a bundle of currency notes put side by side. 
the height says the the bigger value uh, currency notes are made a little bigger 100 rupee note is bigger than the uh, 10 rupee note is bigger than the 5 rupee note and therefore you will see this undulation in this bundle now what Riemann said was take that bundle divide them into small pieces take the biggest one and multiply by the number of fellows there you get the uh, upper value for that or take the smallest one and multiply by the number of fellows there you get roughly this is how, I say, how you count but what Lebesgue said that looks stupid I mean at least unreasonable what I should do is I collect all notes of the same type if I have 100 rupee notes I must pull all those guys right and then see how many 100 rupee notes are there how many 10 rupee notes are there I must count that and that is the value so in other words what he says is you take the height right and see where are all that height reached for each height you look at where is that height reached ok that will give you a set of points at which that value is attained but then th that set of points I have to assign a number now like I assign the length here now for that set of points I must assign a value and that is what he called as measure the Lebesgue measure but if we could do it properly then that value times the measure of that set you add all the values you get the integral so again he did some upper uh, lower all these things so the only thing he did was difference was Lebesgue looked at all of them into interval partitions uh, of the domain set Le I mean Riemann Lebesgue looked at the value set and looked at non-interval possibly non-interval partitions and therefore he had an idea now let us go back again put these things in a different setup I mean a slightly different language ok the same thing ok. So Lebesgue partitioned the range of F instead of the domain of F this is the basic uh, domain of F. So, Riemann partitioned the domain of F, Lebesgue partitioned the value part of it and then calculated the interval. Okay. So, now again uh, we will we'll put it in a different language. Okay. Finally, we will see that all these fellows copy something very simple idea namely if you know how to do for simple things try to push it to the maximum level possible. Now let us look at Riemann. What did Riemann do? Riemann said I could calculate area if it was like this flat. What does that mean? That function takes constant values in sub intervals and there are a finite number. So, Riemann so, what this is what Riemann did first he starts with F ok let me first uh, I an interval F length of i is its quantification. See the interval is a collection of points I have to assign some quantification of for that that length is what I somebody may call it 1 inch somebody may measure it in meters somebody may measure it in foot or whatever it is. So, one quantification the number is assigned to it for every interval a number is assigned to it called the length of the interval and that is a quantification that is why it is called measure ok. So, you see for example it is very very interesting I come from a small town village uh, in Tamil Nadu because uh, my father was had settled there though he was not from Tamil Nadu and my father was a lawyer and uh, the villagers would come there, there were disputes one fellow said that fellow beat me in my 
uh, uh, land came to my land and was beating me in my land and the other fellow was throwing stones at my land from the other side. So, my father would ask them, how far was he when he threw stones? Do you know how that guy would reply? I don't know whether that is, it is still prevalent in the village. I will first tell how that these villagers used to tell in Tamil. He would not say uh, 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 10 feet or 15 feet or 20 feet. He would say Kupurduram. You know what does it mean? If I call him, he would hear. That much distance he was there. You see, so that is his quantification. So he was a Lebeck in his own rights. Okay? So he, that was his measure. And everybody in the village understood what he meant. No, it must be somewhere there. Okay? <laughs> that, that is how the measurements were made. And so you start with that and then build up. Okay, so Riman said this is his way of quantifying a distance, the, the, the length of that interval. The third step he did was if f is constant, say k on i, then I have how is the graph? Then the graph is like this is the interval i, the height is k. Then I define integral over that interval of f dx as what is it? Length of i, that quantification I introduced into the constant value. Okay? That is the height times the base. That is how we define the integral. Now, what does Lebesgue do? Yes, any set. Well, of course, he has to make sure finally some refinements of what sort of sets I can take. There are certain technical difficulties. We settle out, but the general idea is the following: Yes, any set. Two. I will give a quantification for it called measure quantification. Now, what Lebesgue does is my quantification will be consistent with Riemann's quantification. That is, whenever that S is an interval, my quantification will be the same as Riemann's quantification, namely the length. So, let us call it as consistent with length. with length of interval. Okay. And uh, that is where Lebesgue scored over Riemann. He said, I can do whatever you do without changing what you did, but I am going to do new things also. At the same time, because of that consistency requirement, he had to put in certain restrictions on the type of sets that he would consider. Because this is any set in any set in R. Okay. This is I in interval in R. Okay. I will say I will <laughs> now that make it a measure theory class, I mean introduction class, I will make some comments also at the end. Okay. Three, he copies this. Now if f is constant in S, say equal to f equal to k for all x in x, then define integral f of d m over that in s, the set s to be length of f i will be replaced by the quantification of s and the value k. You see that is very, very nice. So, it is like uh, k, uh, k is the density, m is the volume, volume into density is the total mass. Okay. That is the first step he copied. Then let they go on. Then what Riemann did was, well if I can do one, I can put finite number of them like that and calculate a bigger 
area. So, what he did was he took functions which are linear combinations of functions of this type constant in intervals, constant in intervals, constant in intervals. So, the next step that Riemann did was f is equal to summation k j. Uh, let me call this function as such function is called the characteristic function of the interval i k times characteristic function. Okay. Characteristic function is the one that takes the value 1 there, but now it takes the value k and this fellow would call it as the characteristic function of the set s yes, times k. Right. So, what Riemann did next was uh, I will take linear combinations of such sets. Suppose I have assuming let us even take the situation where the intervals are disjoint. Okay, so, that, that uh, mixing up does not you can do that also, but any such thing can be written in the design form later. So, let us forget about it and uh, avoid all technical difficulties and look at this. Then he said it is natural to define integral of f dx by Riemann as what? The area of each piece, so it will be summation kj length of ij j equal to 1 then Lebex says I can also do it. Then Lebex says take a function f which is k j characteristic function of s j, j equal to 1 to n, then I will define integral over the uh, that set, okay. integral f d m to be equal to summation k j measure of s j, j equal to 1 to n. Of course, the, in, the, the integral is now the union of the intervals, those pieces. Now, the integration is over the union of the s j's. Okay. So, both of them are going along and now because of his consistency with, re, with re, Riemann measure le, length of interval, whenever these s j's become all became intervals, you are doing what Raymond did. But now, whenever the interval is the SJs are not intervals, he was doing something different than Riemann. That's that's where he could score. Okay, I will. Uh, okay, then number five. What taking the supremum, etc., etc., is the following. What does he do? Given an arbitrary function, Riemann has approximated f from above by such functions, finite number of constant pieces okay? and then I taken the best of all those things. Similarly, approximated from below and then best of all those. So, what, what does Riemann do? Okay, Let us put this Riemann. This is where Riemann was in trouble, whereas uh, Lebe could go through, but I will not get into the technical difficulties. F a general bounded function that is step 5. If I can get f approximated now if i can get c greater than or equal to f g such a function what do you call such a function these are called step function. So, the collection of all such functions which take constant values on intervals and there are a finite number of intervals, they are called step functions. So, let us call these such functions as step functions. So, g belonging to s, then I can integrate g because by step 4 I know how to integrate 
step functions and then he takes the integral of g dx and what take the smallest of all such g's. Take all possible approximations of g approximations of f from above by step functions and take the best out of them and similarly it does what supremum of h less than or equal to f h belonging to s h x dx and this is what he calls as the upper integral and this is what is called as the lower integral of f right that is exactly what it now remember but then there are problems whether this will become equal or not etc etc but then Lebesgue it found out an idea of what is known as measurable functions not miserable which are nice okay they are very uh, very nice uh, we will say uh, function which is what you call as a random variable when uh, probability terminology okay it's just a random variable okay a measurable function that is f inverse of any borel set is an event okay f measurable function then i can surely get i can surely get and i can surely get these two equal no problem for me at all for all measurable functions okay replace s s by now what is the name that should be given for such functions now they are little more than step functions because thus in the step functions it has to be constant on intervals but now it is constant on some arbitrary sets so what lebe called them was well riemann started with those things because they were simple functions these were easy to integrate so he called them simple functions so let me call this as a uh, sigma functions of this type as sigma and then replace s by sigma called simple functions and all go through okay. and we got an integral which is now better than riemann because he could now integrate functions which are constants not necessarily an interval but what are known as those sets which are measurable sets which are called which he called as Lebesgue measurable sets. That is the rough idea, general idea of uh, uh, what Lebesgue integral is. Okay, but now it's very, uh, very clear that we don't have to do Lebesgue and real line. You see, we can replace the real number by any arbitrary set, and all I have to do is I have to have a quantification. It, there is no consistency I require now, but I have to have some consistency with the idea of measure. What is the idea of measure consistency? Well, if I took, if I put two disjoint things, the volume in this plus the volume in this together, if I put all them, them in one, then the total volume will be this plus this, additivity. Okay. And then finite number of them disjoint vessels i put them all in one vessel whichever way i measure i must get them so the measure of the union is equal to the sum of the individuals finite if it also happens for a sequence that is what is that happens for intervals and therefore we want that the measure of the union the quantification of a union of a sequence must be equal to the sum of the individual quantifications when these sequence elements are disjoint okay so this is what euclid wrote in his book that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts this is the way he expressed okay this idea of measure which is not true when you come to arbitrary set theory okay we put a countable set and a countable set and you can have a subset which is also a countable set the whole is not equal to the sum of this and all kinds of mess you can get into but in the sort of quantification we have this so you replace this by omega then this 
by a quantification. What is the quantification? With each set, it should assign a number, and that is what we did. What is the finite set? The number of elements, and if it's an infinite set, it's infinite measure. Then how do I do integration? Constant in these sets. Then the integral is that constant into the quantification. Okay. So if I have now an infinite set in the my counting measure. If I have an infinite set, if the function is constant, the integral will be infinite because the value into the measure, the measure will be infinite because it's an infinite set in mix. So the integral will be. So only fellows who will have finite integral are those fellows which will be non-zero only at a finite number of points. So in the counting measure case, all integration brings it down to a finite number of. points those are the uh, special simple functions okay so the simple functions are those functions which take constant values on disjoint sets on a finite number of them and then go through this step you get the integration with respect to the general measure that's what measure theory and integration is so basically try to put with all the technical details what riemann did in a slightly general setup riemann had known clue Uh, how to measure things other than intervals and lebeck brought the idea of how we could possibly measure other sets in the real line which is consistent with the notion of lengths whenever it comes to interval and then everybody found out what exactly are the properties of this that come into the picture and those properties essential properties countable additivity and that was brought in and general measure comes in and all these simple functions simple functions simple functions approximate from above from below supremum infimum these to be equal and the idea of course rest of the ball game is the same okay so the underlying idea is the same it all started with riemann and everybody started improving upon riemann but this is the interesting thing is at no time you lose what you got in the previous step when lebeck did integration on the real line it was with respect to the idea of area and all if you have that then you have to have that lebeck measure only consistent with the interval there is a unique extension theorem there is no other measure you can get but there are other types of quantifications like you can dope at a point with a particular material and the whole density changes when you come near that point the whole integration rule will be different so then Uh, the the ideas of general measure have to come into picture so this is the general idea of what measure and integration is and actually this is all it the rest of it is all technical details you have to write when this is not valid what condition are required etc etc intuitively all that happens is only this okay so now where was i right so now let's look at uh, the omega to be any set and the measure i uh, power set is the set of all subsets and then let's take measure of any set to be the cardinality of s if s is finite or the number of elements is equal to plus infinity if s is an infinite set okay now what are simple functions now a simple function means what first of all the role of intervals must be played by some sets okay and I, i want to multiply them by the measure so let's first take the measure to be finite that means these sjs must be finite sets so let's take the simplest situation s1 s2 sn finite disjoint finite sets mutually disjoint right then K1, K2, Kn complex numbers. 
real or complex numbers. You can even take complex uh, functions. Okay. Then what is this function? So, I have now this omega and I have these disjoint sets S1, S2, S3, Sn. Now, I have a function which takes the value k1 at all these points, takes the value k2 at all these points, kn at all these points and 0 at all these points. So, therefore, f is a function mapping omega to C f of s equal to k j if s belongs to s j 0 otherwise. That is the function. Okay. So, in other words, it is a pair of function. I, I stand here and uh, throw a ball. If the ball falls in this set, I get k2 rupees. If the ball falls on that set, I get kn rupees and if the ball does not fall in any of the sets, I get 0 rupees. And that if the k1 and k2 can be negative, then it the payoff may be negative also. I may lose money. If kj, if k4 is minus 25 and if I go and hit the ball blindfold on k sj set, I lose 25 rupees in the game. So, this is just a gambling, okay? like the black jack. Okay. If you, have, if you have gambled, how many of you have gambled in your life? Tell me the truth. Okay. Nobody? I never have come across such wonderful students because I never was. We used to play cards in the E block in the good old days. Okay. Gamble. Okay. There used to be Diwali specials and all. Okay. All night sessions. But it is very interesting because you learn a lot of things about probability theory there. I learned a lot of probability theory while playing these things. Okay. Anyway, but you do a lot of theoretical probability, probably most of you are going, going all kinds of random processes and all, but never gone and played even a simple one random process with 52 cards. Okay. Anyway, uh, so th this is what a function uh, I am looking at. This is a very simple function. That is why it is called a simple function. Okay. Now, how do I define the integral of this now? with respect to this measure integral over omega okay this one entire set the function is defined over all omega now i will have to simply define it as j equal to 1 to n kj the measure of this j that just like Riemann did instead of length i have measured and the measure is the number of points in s j equal to 1 to n kj number of elements in this is how we start discrete probability. Okay. Okay. So that's roughly the what the idea that I am having. Okay. So now you see these are all the points. For example, the function that I wrote. These are all the points at which the function is not zero, and all other places the function is zero. So, we call the set of all points where the function is not 0 at the support of the function in this case. So, S f, so let f mapping omega to C be any function which maps that is for every point in omega there is a pair of amount which is a complex number which is associated. Then S f the set of all omega in omega for which f omega is not equal to 0 is called the support. In this case, the word support is sometimes when you have topological ideas, it is a little bit more you have to take a closure of this set. Support of the function f. That is where the function is supported, all other places is 0. Okay. So, we have the notion of the support of a function. Now, the support of a function can be finite, 
in which case his measure is finite the support of the function can be infinite in which case his measure is infinite okay so sf may be finite or a an infinite sequence or uncountably infinite or uncountably infinite now these two cases we will simply call the support is just countable okay finite and countably infinite together will be called countable uncountably infinite sequence is uncountable okay okay so now i am going to look at functions i'm going to first of all okay let me call uh first of all right uh let me call f of omega to be the collection of all functions from omega to c so i am going to look at all possible function that i can define from omega to c all possible payoff functions okay then i am now in that going to look at only some special type of fellows the next is i will call it fc omega to be all those functions for which the support is countable that is the function is not zero only at a finite number of points or at most a sequence of points for example if you take omega to be real i can't have the function to be one on the whole interval 0 1 because then i have the function not zero on an uncountable set i am allowing i am going to look at only those functions which are not zero on a finite set or at most at a sequence of points because i can then i write sum and all those things okay then i am going to look at so let one less than equal to less than infinity as before the usual where a real number then i am going to look at lp omega mu this is how the general lp spaces are defined with respect to different measures over different sets okay lp omega mu to be all those functions f in fc omega that is all those functions whose support is either finite or a countable sequence such that i will first write the standard notation mod f omega to the power of p d mu omega what does this mean is finite what does this integral mean now i have to integrate a function called mod f to the power of p so what i am going to look at is a function g which is g of omega is mod f omega to the power of p okay f is given so i am going to so now since f is not zero only in a countable set g will also be not zero only in a countable set now what is meant by integral well i can approximate this function by a simple function what simple function suppose it is finite its support is finite it is already a simple function 1 into that point 1 into that point the value into that point and so on so forth okay so suppose let me finish this 
suppose S f is finite say omega 1 omega k suppose S f is just a finite number of points then g of omega is equal to summation okay let me call it as k j to the power of k j let me just write k j characteristic function of the singleton set omega j j equal to 1 to k where k j is mod f omega j to the power of p that is all okay. the value of the function at the point omega j is t and it takes that value only at this point because I have put characteristic function over. So, this is a simple function. So, if it is a simple function what is the integral of g is simply k j j equal to 1 to k the measure of this set this is the set S j now what is the measure of this set number of points it is a finite set the counting measure is the number of points in that set. So, it is just 1 which is simply j equal to 1 to k mod f omega j to the power of p that is how the integral is defined. Okay, so, this is what integral of mod f to the power of p over omega is that is if S f is finite if S f is infinite what will happen. I will go on improve my approximation and finally, I will get j equal to 1 to all the way the infinite sum and once I get an infinite sum I have to make sure it is finite. So, that is what I meant here. So, okay, so if is infinite sequence omega 1, omega 2 etcetera then integral mod f to the power of p d mu over omega is simply j equal to 1 to infinity mod f omega j to the power of p. Okay. Uh, that is so it is a little general of the sequences we had we have a sequence of points whose sum is finite, but then the sequence of points may be different for different functions the support of f these points omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 may vary for different uh, function, different functions will have different support. So, we take all such functions. So, therefore, this I can write as f belonging to f c omega such that summation j equal to 1 to infinity mod f omega j to the power of p is less than infinity. And on this we can define norm of f. I will call it as mu, it comes from the measure mu is defined to be this integral. Which is summation j equal to 1 or let me put it this way omega belonging to the support of f mod of f omega to the power of p to the power of 1 omega. These points are nothing but the points in the support of f. So, I will write it in that form that takes care of all finite and infinite both. Okay. This is a norm. Okay. This is analogous to the little LP and uh, the standard Lebesgue spaces that we have. Again, this will be a inner product space only when p equal to 2, only when p equal to 2. We will come back to this space. The I will prove this in next class. The parallelogram law is satisfied only when p equal to 2. So, that is the only case where you get all these LP spaces will give you that inner product space only when p equal to 2. And that is the case where the, the p and its conjugate q are equal 1 over p plus 1 over q must be equal to 1 when p equal to 2 q is also equal to 2 that sort of symmetry must be there the number and its conjugate are equal that is self conjugate 
then nice things happen. So, that is a certain amount of self conjugacy that is in Hilbert space structures. Okay. Uh, many places you see this uh, self conjugacy. I will take up this example again a uh, few more times. What I will do in the next class is I will really show that this part, uh, this the, the, in all these LP spaces, whether you take uh, the, our Lebesgue LP spaces or whether you take this counting measure LP spaces, we will show that only when p equal to 2 the parallelogram law is satisfied. Okay, I think it is time to stop.